Thanks so much. It's great to be with you uh, this evening. And I kept thinking all week about agape latte. I was thinking about different stories with coffee. And the first story I was thinking about was a few years ago, I just started studying for the Jesuits here at BC. And my friend, Matt, started going out with a girl in New York. And so I went down, I took the bus Columbus Day weekend. I found out that that's probably a bad time to take a bus on a Friday afternoon, Columbus Day weekend. I go down and we go out to dinner for burgers on the Upper East Side of Manhattan at uh, J.G. Mellon. Great burger place, it's cash only, these green checkered tables. And we get talking and somehow the topic comes up. Have you ever used a fake name? Has anyone here ever used a fake name? You don't have to tell me the reason. You don't have to, Father Casey, you use a fake ID or a fake name? So, <laughs> so, so Matt's new girlfriend, Carmel, says, actually, my fake name is Liz. And I was like, wow, this is like, I'm just meeting her. She's kind of an international woman of mystery. What's going on here? I'm like, when do you use this fake name, Liz? And she said, well, my name's Carmel. And Whenever I go into a Starbucks and whatever I order, I make my order and they say, what's your name? And she says, caramel. Well, sure enough, whatever I order, they put two shots of caramel in my order and that's why now I go by Liz when they ask me my name. I graduated with two degrees here for my Jesuit uh, studies, a Master's of Divinity and a Licentiate in Sacred Theology. So kind of two Master's degrees. The Licentiate was a church degree. And what that means is that I have a license to teach in any seminary, pontifical seminary, approved by the Pope in the world because of that degree. So the first place the Jesuits send me with this exalted license is to teach seventh grade religion at Boston College High School. So I find myself teaching religion, and I, I learned early on that, is anyone here from Boston College High School? Mac? Thanks for being here. So did you go to Arupe, seventh and eighth grade? Okay, so seventh grade, I'm teaching religion. And I realized for seventh grade boys, it's really important to get them to use their imagination, get them to work in groups, get them to work with their hands, and then they'll be happy. So we're working on this project where I had them design their own parish, their own church. And tell me a little bit about that church and the structure of it and how that can help serve the greater community around them. So there's all these different variations of popsicle sticks and cardboard boxes and shoe boxes and everything. And then this one student is drawing this floor plan and next to the church, he's drawing this box and it says, D, D. And it, one D is in kind of a purple, one D is in an orange. And I was like, Tommy, what, what, are, you, what are you drawing right next to the church that's a D, D? And he looks up at me like I have three heads. He says, donkeys. You need the Dunkin' Donuts for the kids' mass, the munchkins and the coffee. So I figured that's kind of like where we're at tonight. Uh, the intersection of, of faith and coffee. The next year I was teaching, and I must have been telling that story, because one of my students, he must have been from Milton or Hingham or something like that, I was saying coffee, and he was just saying to himself, coffee, 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 kind of the way I was saying it with my New York accent. But I was thinking, to these days with everything going on, we find ourselves, I find myself going for more walks, spending more time in nature, praying on the go as I walk around. And I was thinking, when you, when you do that, you start to notice things. And if you took a walk around campus, think of all of the different pieces of art or architecture that you would notice. I think of the St. Ignatius statue. And if you look at that statue of St. Ignatius, with one hand he's holding his heart, and the other hand he kind of has it out like this, offering possibility. 
He's got one hand on his heart and another one offering possibility. And I'd like to stick with that image for a moment. Also, if you look at it, it looks like he's moving forward. And if you look at his clothes, the wind's coming at him. Now, I don't know if that wind is the Holy Spirit. I don't know if that wind is maybe other spirits that are kind of holding him back. But I think that's just a good image for us these days. He's holding his heart and he's paying attention to the possibilities that God has for him. I was working in, in, sports, in the sports marketing industry in New York in my mid-20s, and my office it was kind of like a cube farm. There was cubicles everywhere, and on my cubicle I had a bunch of signed football helmets and signed baseballs and photographs, and at some point one of my colleagues, he, it was his job for our clients like Pepsi and MasterCard, to sign the different athletes that would be in the promotions. So if you watched a commercial or if there was kind of a sales conference for a particular brand, he's the one that would get that athlete, sign that athlete, work with that athlete's agent. And he was looking at this video of Joe Theismann. Joe Theismann played for the Washington football team a long time ago. He also played for a school in South Bend most people haven't heard of. And he was doing this sales conference, and he kept telling people, if you're going to hit your sales goals this year, you got to write down your goals. you got to write them all down. What do you think it says in the locker room and training camp? It says, win the Super Bowl. Write down your goal. So I had that just in my head, like a bad song, over and over again. And I found myself on an airplane traveling for business. And my thing with airplanes, do you remember we used to be on airplanes sometimes? Yeah, not anymore. Well, I always fall asleep as soon as I sit down. And at the time, it wasn't like we carried AirPods or, you know, headphones or anything. And so when you fall asleep, when you sit down immediately, you miss the flight attendant offering the headphones. So I completely missed that. So I had nothing to do on the plane. I forgot a book. And so what do I do? I start to write down my goals. And I wrote down every possible goal I could think of. I was thinking about, oh, I have to write a thank you note um, to my uncle for something. Or I have this goal of running the New York City Marathon. I went to a party the year before, but I want to be on the streets. I want to run the marathon. And one of the things I also wrote was explore the Jesuits. Sorry, is there a little feedback? Is, that, is there anything I could do? Is that, okay. Um, was, was explore the Jesuits. And so what did that mean for me? For me, my uncle was a Jesuit, and so it had that kind of background that he was my favorite uncle, Whenever he was around, you felt like Jesus was close, and you felt that he was a lot of fun. A lot of our friends called him their uncle, too. I also went to Loyola University, Maryland, and I got to know the priests there, the Jesuits there, as professors and um, as our Jesuit class moderator. I found myself talking to my friend in, in our bunk beds at night, saying, that was an awesome homily. It was so down to earth. I wonder what it would be like to be a Jesuit. And we just kind of ponder that. What would that be like? Well, things fast forwarded, but now I'm on a plane, I'm writing down my goals, and this is one of my goals. So I come back from wherever I was going, and I'm back in New York City. I have a rent control apartment in Stuyvesant Town. I was posing as Dorothy White, an uh, 86-year-old um, cousin, that, so I could get rent control. That's a whole other story. Uh, hopefully they don't track us down through this video. I have a lot of back rent I probably owe at this point. But I found myself at Mass, and I saw in the bulletin a little ad saying, we need volunteers for a nursing home, Cabrini Nursing Home in the East Village. And I had started to think about exploring the Jesuits, but I felt like I really couldn't because as much as I was reading Father Jim Martin's books, and I was feeling attracted to it. I wasn't doing any service. I didn't really do much service at Loyola, a day here and there. 
But I felt like if I'm going to actually think about this life of service, I should do some kind of regular service. And I saw this bulletin ad that they needed volunteers in a nursing home on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. And that's pretty early if you're in your mid-20s. I'm sure it's pretty early if you're in college. So I signed up for it. It, t- it tamed my Friday nights a little bit. And I found myself going, getting a cup of coffee, going down to Caprini Nursing Home. And it was my job to check in with Sister Elaine. And Sister Elaine would hand me a list of all the patients, all the people, all the guests who wanted to go to Mass on Saturday mornings. And I had to go find them and get their chairs and wheel them into the elevator. Four by four, I'd hold the elevator and put them in one by one, and then take in the Mass. Well, little by little, Sister Elaine relied on me. Soon I was reading. Then I was a Eucharistic minister. Then the priest stopped showing up. I was like, oh, maybe this is a sign. He was elderly himself. She was having communion services, and she'd say, would you like to do the reflection? And that's why I speak so loudly now, because I was trying to give a reflection to senior citizens at this nursing home. But little by little, I started to feel like my heart was on fire. Going back to that image of St. Ignatius, I was paying attention, writing down my goals, paying attention to what was in my heart, thinking about what these possibilities God had for me. And then something happened. Out of nowhere, I got my bonus from the last job I had. I didn't think I was going to get it. I thought... You know, I left that job around Christmas time, and that meant no bonus. Well, that bonus came in, and guess what that meant? I'm going to the Hamptons. I got in on a Hamptons share with about 30 people. I think there are three rooms, and that was my whole summer, every weekend. Well, that meant no Cabrini nursing home for me. Well, then comes the fall, and... Fall in New York City. Remember that goal I wrote down about running the New York City Marathon? So I do that. And that takes me into the first week of November. And mid-November, I'm thinking, ah, I should really go back to the nursing home. I should go back. But I feel like Sister Elaine is going to scold me. What is this going to be like? So somehow I got the courage to go back. And I went back, went up to the fourth floor where the chapel was, and I see Sister Elaine coming out. And she didn't really have good eyesight. She had no peripheral vision. And she says, Patrick, is that you? And she gave me a big hug. She wouldn't be able to deal with social distancing. She just gave me this huge hug. And then she just looked at me, and she said, I want you to know something. I know as a young person that you're going to have a lot of different opportunities and that sometimes you might miss being here for different reasons. But I want you to know something. No matter how long you're gone or how many Saturdays you miss, you're always welcome back here without judgment. For me, whenever I read the story of the prodigal son coming home, That's what I experienced. That idea of like, I had been paying attention to what's on my heart. I had been paying attention to God's possibilities. And then I took a little break from that. And here it was, Sister Elaine welcoming me back. I think if she scolded me in that moment, I certainly wouldn't be here right now. But that possibility that she offered me. So I continued on, and um, I kept reading and doing some more service and contacted the Jesuits and did some of the come and sees as I'm getting to know the Jesuits. I had a spiritual director, so I'm learning how to pray and making this decision in prayer. But I had this one worry that I wouldn't have any friends in the Jesuits. I thought they were all, I don't know, I thought the Jesuits were a lot of things. I just figured... I would do this because I'd I'd be living out my purpose, but I don't know what community life would be like. 
And then I went to a couple of visits, and I heard people laugh. I heard people tell stories. I saw people that were down to earth. And I was like, all right, I can do this. So I applied, and I was all confirming, and then I was accepted. And in the summer I was accepted, little by little I started to tell my family. And then I had to tell my nieces and nephews, or my brothers and sisters told my nieces and nephews. And my niece Natalie said to my, um, my brother Dennis, I know why Uncle Patrick is becoming a Jesuit, because he couldn't find anyone to marry him. I was like, thanks. And then Isabel was mad because she wouldn't get to become a um, flower girl at my wedding, so that was... Yeah, she was really mad about that. She still holds that over my head. But I remember being close to my two nephews, Nolan and Owen. They were about 9 and 11 at the time. And they lived in Westchester in Rye, New York, and that was right by where I was working. I was doing a reverse commute outside the city with driving each day. And in the beginning of that, I just felt like a lot of things had been canceled for me. Like, I couldn't just hop on a subway right after work, or I couldn't meet my brother Dennis, like I used to uh, for lunch, and just take a subway and then might be back to the office. I had to get in the car and go all the way out to north of the city. But then I realized early on that I could be at any of their games, their hockey games, lacrosse games, their baseball games, in five minutes. It was like, you ever, does anyone ever watch the Flintstones? Now, well, you're all at home Zooming, so I guess you have plenty of time to watch cartoons, but the Flintstones, you know how Fred gets out of the car, he finishes work, and he just goes right into his car, he slides down, and yabba dabba do, he's on to his next thing. That's the way I was. And I'd be at the field, be able to be at their, their games. I was like a permanent third base coach, backup ump, uh, referee at all their games. Well, now I'm going into the Jesuits. And I had this sense that this is going to be really tough. This is going to be a tough part about going into the Jesuits, saying goodbye to these guys. And Owen... My nephew is the younger of the two, kept saying to me, is this the last time we're going to see you before you go away? Is this the last time we're going to see you before you go away? Well, finally it was. And I gave him a big hug, and his brother, and my sister. And I got in the car and started driving back to Manhattan. And I started to cry. And I tell you this story so that you know that people from New York actually have hearts. <laughs> now, what I did there was I prayed the examine. And I was pretty honest with God. I looked back over my time just being at that job, the last four years. And I asked for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I even imagined Jesus was sitting shotgun with me, and I was talking with him in the car. And I said, you know, this isn't fair. But then again, that's what I thought when I first got here, that this isn't fair, that I'm not working in the city anymore. And then I really grew to like it, and I thought of all the different games I was able to get back to. I kind of reviewed that time, those four years. And then I stuck with one moment, that moment of saying goodbye. I said, Jesus, this isn't fair. I'm ready to become a Jesuit. I'm ready for this new life, but... It's really tough to say goodbye to these guys. And Jesus said to me, when I heard in prayer was, you're going to have the chance to be a coach and a teacher and a father figure for so many other boys and girls. And you're always going to have contact with Nolan and Owen. You're always going to be able to shoot them a note on their birthday. Although I forgot Owen's birthday. Nick, my other nephew is here. I forgot Owen's birthday yesterday. Sorry, Owen, if you're watching at home. You probably shut me off. Um, you'll be always be able to be in touch with them. But what I'm asking you to do is to open your eyes to this possibility that I'm offering you. And that's come true. I think of all the families I've gotten to know over my time in formation, the families at BC High, the number of students here at BC, and being connected here through the masses. And so I go back to that image from the beginning that image of paying attention to the desires that are in your heart, to exploring those, un uncovering them in prayer, 
uncovering them just by maybe journaling or writing it down. And then paying attention to all the different possibilities God is offering you right now. You might say, right now? Are you kidding me? There's no possibilities. Well, that's why it takes a little bit longer. I mean, for me, I was doing that on a plane completely shut off from the world. I thought of this image because I was pushed out into the world walking around campus. So what are those possibilities for you? What's on your heart? Maybe you could just ponder that for a second. What is on your heart these days? And as you ponder that, what is God offering you in possibility? And as you think about that image of St. Ignatius, Think of that open hand too, the possibilities of being open to what they may be, but also realizing that Jesus, on the cross, his palms are open, and he's always willing to hold your hand and be there as your companion. There's no social distancing with God. To hold your hand and be your companion in whatever it is when you follow your heart and talk it over with him. Mm-hmm.